Hey, how you doing? Justin here. Today we are checking out Sympathy for the Devil by the Rolling Stones. We'll talk a little bit about the album version, but the really cool stuff for this particular tune is the live version from Get Your Ya Ya's Out. Uh, if you don't know that one, that's definitely the one that you should check out for funky guitar stuff. Incredible solos there from uh, Keith Richards and from Mick Taylor. Um, and a lot more guitar than on the original recorded version, which, if I am right, doesn't seem to have any guitar on it at all. Um, so if you happen to be playing it in a band like that, then you want a piano player is going to be doing most of the hard work and you're probably going to end up playing some percussion. It's probably not a bad thing. Anyhow, so the song is actually pretty simple. There's two main chord sequences, one of which goes E, D, A and E, and the other one which goes B, B, E and E. And then there's an occasional one bar tag kind of thing at the end of the verses of an extra bar of E chord there. So breaking it down just to be as absolutely as simple as it could, just sticking a four down strums to the bar, we'd end up having this E chord for one bar, then D chord for one bar, then A chord for a bar, and back to E chord for a bar. Same thing again. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm an A chord. Again, I've been around for a D gone years. So a chord man still is E. And that's that's kind of it. In the most basic form that you you could ask for, that's kind of the the easiest strumming, if you like. Now the other section actually I should mention is a B chord. So now you could play B chord down here at the second fret, which might seem the first the most obvious choice because it's closer to the E chord. Uh, but I think the one up at the seventh fret is kind of easier to play and sounds a bit better as well because you a lot it's kind of fuller sound having that top string ringing out as well as part of that B chord. So you probably want to use like the E shaped bar chord up at the seventh fret there for the B chord. Um, I always thought of it as just being one strum and then letting it ring out again, like one strum per bar. But um, listening to it closer on the on the yayas, one Mick Taylor continues to do the 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 regular strumming pattern, which is something we'll talk about in just a second. Although it wouldn't hurt just to pleased to meet you, uh, oh, guess my name. And then go back to the rhythm on the ear. That kind of you know works as well. A lot of uh, people doing covers of this song might will probably approach it that way. I don't expect it's going to take you too long to get used to those basic chords and four down strums to the bar. So really what you want to kick off with next is a little bit more work on the rhythm. Um, and there's a really nice rhythm pattern that's played by Mick Taylor on the Get the Yaya's version. Now, as I mentioned, the original recording doesn't really have any guitar to copy. So you could either make up your own strumming pattern, which is not a bad thing to be doing at all. Uh, but if you want a kind of a nice starting point, the Mick Taylor strumming pattern, which he uses pretty consistently through the whole tune on the on the when he's not doing solos, um, is a really, really nice one. It's a 16th note strumming pattern. Um, I'm going to break it down beat by beat first of all, and then I will put it together slowly. So um, I'm just going to use my fingers just resting on the guitar strings there so you can nice and clearly hear where the strumming is. So beat one is just one and. So down and down, one and. Very simple. Write that down. One and and then down and down above those two. On beat two, we've got down, down, up. Okay, so two, e, and, a uh, would be the count. Two, e, and and ah. Uh. Okay, so the hand will strum down, it will move back up without strumming, and then down, up. Okay, beat three, we have a miss on beat three, and then up, down on the E and the and. So three, E, and. Three, E, and. Three with the downstroke missing, then E, and. Up, down. And then on beat four, we miss beat four with the downstroke again, and we have up, down, up. So four, E, and, up. Uh. Miss, up, down, up. Okay, let me put the first two beats together first of all. So down, 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 up. Pretty simple, hey? One, and, two, and, up. Uh. One, and, two, and, up. Uh. Okay, when we add in beat three, remember we're not playing on beat three. So we have one, and, two, and, up, uh, three, E, and. One and two and up uh, three E and. Now we add in beat four. One and two and up uh, three E and four E and uh, down 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 up up down up down up down 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 up 
up down, up down, up one and two e and up three e and four e and up one and two e and up three e and four e and up. Okay, all of these rhythm patterns a lot easier to write down the count. Write down the down and ups. Biggest thing to remember is that your hand is moving consistently, okay? If you get the hand moving consistently and you put an extra strum in or you miss a strum, it doesn't really matter. So long as you're keeping the hand moving, you'll stay in the groove, okay? Big deal. Also big deal playing along with the original recording to kind of suck up some of the vibe there. Um, when you're playing along with a rhythm pattern like that with the actual recording, you kind of suck in some of the vibe There's because it's not pure, you know, rhythm and, and pockets and all of those sort of terms aren't, uh, mathematically correct all the time. They're a little bit human and the best way of absorbing that is playing along with the original recording so that you can hear the original recording, okay? If you turn your guitar up too loud and you just can distantly hear the original recording, it's probably not going to help too much. So you want to play around with the adjustment of the level of your guitar against the, the backing track. Anyway, so that would be the next step is would be applying that rhythm then to the strumming pattern, okay? So let's just speed it up a little bit more first. So we're still back with the mute. So three, four, one and two e and up three e and four e and a one and two e and up three e and four e and a one and two e and up three e and four e down 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 up up down up down up down 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 up up down up down up okay so i'm going to leave you to do the practice to get from the really super slow version to that one but you want to be able to do the rhythm pattern first before you start applying it to the chords, okay? Otherwise, it's too many things to think about. You'll be starting to ch change the chords and, and it'll knock you off your rhythm or what, you know. D d get, the, get the rhythm sorted so you don't have to think about it so it's automated and then you can apply it to the chords easily. So once you go to apply it, so on the E, three, four, E, to D, A, E. E. Now I'm just noticing now that I'm starting to put in a few mutes as well and, uh, and try and drop my picker. Okay, so I actually had to pause there for a second and figure out what on earth I was doing with the muting because as soon as I started playing the pattern, there were some muting things going on and it was a mixture of the left hand and the right hand. Uh, was, those sort of things are really difficult to explain. They're difficult for me to even realize what I'm doing half the time. So I can hear, I was like, oh, hang on, I'm doing some muting. I'm going to have to try and explain that. Otherwise you guys will be going, hang on, I'm doing the pattern that you said you were going to do, but it doesn't sound the same. And I don't think that's kind of fair. So what I figured out was, uh, on some of the chords, but not all of the chords and not all of the time, I was putting a mute on the and after two, which would normally have been a down strum, but sometimes I was putting a mute there instead. And then I was putting another mute on beat four. And the mute would either come from the outside of this hand. So as I'm just being lazy, if I just do it only with this hand. You can hear, if I just, if I leave it out, Doesn't sound the same, does it? One and two, out. And I'm just kind of lazy with my hand as I'm strumming and allowing that outside part of the hand to just kind of rest down on the strings on the and after two. So if you've written out the strumming as I suggested, on the and after two, just put like a little cross above that so that you know that you can put a mute there if you want and on beat four as well. So really slow. One and two E and a three E and four E and a one and two E and a three E and four E and a. Okay, and it's not that exact, right? I'm, I'm kind of making a bigger meal of it really than it, than it is. It's just a very subtle thing, but it does make a difference to the, to the sound of the groove when you introduce those sort of things, particularly if you're playing by yourself. Okay, so in a band situation, you might not have to do that kind of stuff. Can't remember if Mick Taylor did it on the original recording or not, to be completely honest. But um, uh, it's definitely something that I found myself doing that I thought I'd probably be helpful to explain. Sometimes on the D and the A chord, as well as or instead of doing it with that hand, I was using these fingers down, particularly on the A chord. 
I'm doing these finger these three fingers are kind of muted. Beat on beats the end after uh, two and beat three sometimes instead of on beat four. So it's it's one of those things that you're just going to have to vibe on a bit. I'm afraid. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm I don't want you to run into a rabbit hole thinking about it too much. But be aware that I'm muting sometimes with this hand and muting with the outside part of my hand as well. And the easiest way I've always learned to do stuff like that, rhythm patterns like, this, is listen to the original recording and trying to just figure out how to make my guitar sound like the original recording. I'm not. I don't calculate. That's why I'm a bit like, oh, I don't know what I'm. Do what was I doing there? You know, and and probably it'd be the same for m most guitar players if they try and explain exactly what they're doing. So, to get to that point is just about letting your body get on with it. You know, like I want my I want my guitar to sound like that when I'm playing, and let your body kind of figure it out. So, well, that's a lot of talk about that rhythm pattern, isn't it? But uh, hopefully, you find that helpful. But before we go on to looking at Keith Richards' part. The, the kind of groovy Hendrixy style thing. I want to talk about some of the other uh, options for the chords here that uh, that you got that are kind of interesting. Um, the first thing is if we got the E chord, D chord is the second chord. The third chord on the record, mainly because of the bass line. The bass line has this real strong C sharp A, C sharp D, D sharp E, little. Um, that this kind of funky little line going on in the bass and being able to put that C sharp on the bass on the A chord for the first beat I think sounds real nice it just makes it sound a lot more like the record so having E even on the most basic strumming D two three four here A just say and all I'm doing is playing an A with a little mini bar instead of kind of regular uh, a using three fingers, just using my first finger, not playing the thinner string of course, and then using my third finger to play the note C sharp, which is the fourth fret of the fifth string. So the chord, the proper chord name will be A slash C sharp, A chord with a C sharp bass note. And just adding that on, on beat one of bar three, the one on the A chord, I think really works nicely. So just one, two, or especially let's add in that other strumming pattern. So three, four, E. D, near the A. Adding a bit of E sus four on the E chord works real nice as well. Here it is. That E sus four is a real dominant part of that sound. You can hear it, it's kind of all over the track originally on the piano, of course, but works really easily just having the E chord with the sus there. On the D chord, you could be using sus4 and sus2 as well. That really doesn't kind of feel as right to me to do that, but you definitely could. And on the A chord, you can use the sus4 as well. Sus2 just doesn't sound appropriate to my ear anyway, but you, there's nothing that says you couldn't do it. Um, on the B chord, and I've played it in cover bands, I've quite often played this B with the thinnest two strings left open, so lifting the bar up. It just seems to add a little bit more weight to it. It's again, it's quite a piano-y kind of thing to do of having notes that are close together. It's usually a bit harder on guitar, but uh, I think worth having a look at. So there's a couple of little options to play around with, especially if you know the lead guitar is going to take a long solo. You want a few things to keep yourself amused uh, while you're locking into your groove there in the rhythm part. Uh, the the um, just to get a clean sound, just to mention the sound as well. Um, uh, the front humbucker of this guitar is a splittable one, so I'm just using the, like one half of that humbucker. And I've also backed the volume down to kind of clean the sound up uh, a little bit. But for the Keith part uh, from Yaya's, I wanted a bit crunchier, so I'm using the middle pickup, which is the two humbuckers together, and I turn the volume back up. And <laughs> a 
lovely, lovely guitar part. One of my favorite rhythm guitar parts ever, I think. Um, and it's really nice if you look at what's going on. I'm going to try and explain to you more than just like what was played, but like how to use it on your own kind of terms as well. So the first, the first thing we're doing, we're using the first finger and we're barring strings uh, five, four, three, maybe two as well, but that's not really coming out. It's mainly strings five, four, and three. And that's at the ninth fret. And then we're hammering the third finger down the eleventh fret of the fifth string. It's a very common kind of a Hendrixy trick, this. Okay, it, it is really of that era. So that's the first thing, first uh, section of the lick. And then we do again, we're playing the ninth fret, hammering down the third finger in the eleventh fret of the fifth string. Then we play again the ninth fret, now focusing on the middle two strings, the fourth and third strings. And then we're again hammering the third finger down in the eleventh fret, this time in the fourth string. And then we play it again, those middle two strings. that count right is pretty important although Keith does a lot of variation so right at the beginning actually it's not one and it's but later in the song it's so the hammer on is going on the and for most of the song that would be the kind of the most uh, generic version of it I guess but right at the beginning he's doing the hammer on a little bit quicker like instantly the first one. Okay, so that the what I explained to you before was the riff in E. And what I think it's important to realize here is that it's if you think of those the notes in the ninth fret is is based around this kind of regular fifth string root E chord. Most of you would know that. And I've got some lessons on the Hendrix rhythm guitar style, which you might want to go and check out over on the website. Really common kind of stuff that Hendrix was using in like Wind Cries Mary and that kind of tune. But here he's, he's just using the front part. It, it really it would come from a, a G-shaped bar chord, which is a real pig to play, really. We don't tend to in practice play the whole thing. But really important when you're doing that kind of thing that you see that we're in E. So either seeing the root note there or imagining the root note down there at the seventh fret of the fifth string. That's the root note of the chord, right? So you could use that any time that you've got an E chord. You could be using that trick, okay, in, in, in other songs as well, which I think is an important thing to try and steal from when you're learning a tune like this, not just learning to play the song, but nicking the licks that you could use in other circumstances, right? That's the E chord. Now, the second chord in this song is a D chord, so it's exactly the same stuff moved back two frets. So E. Now we've got an A chord. And this is another classic Stones move that he uses a whole lot, but it's playing the ninth fret on strings two, three, and four, first finger bar. Then hammering second finger down in the tenth fret and third finger down in the eleventh, uh, sorry, second finger down tenth fret of the second string, third finger hammering down in the eleventh fret of the fourth string. Okay, it's actually part of a C shape bar chord for an A chord. Okay, so. Um, that would be 12, 11, 10, 11, uh, 12, 11, 9, 10, 9 would be the tab for that. I can put some chord boxes up on the uh, on the website if you uh, if you ask me enough people ask me in the comments I'll make some chord boxes for you so you can see how that works. But it, it's kind of going E A is what's going on. Yeah, that's the effect of the, that riff. And then just because he's Keith and he does amazing riffs. He moves the third finger over to the uh, 11th fret on the third string. Uh, and then lifts off second and third fingers. And then back to E. E. D. A. You just go. That's just that where the, the, I 
keep second finger keeps staying down. Should be coming off. So one and two, three e and a four e and one and two, three e and a four e and one and two, three e and a four and one, two, three e and a four. Bad note go. There was definitely one around there somewhere. There's lots of variations that happen through the track. He's, Keith's one of those guys, he's fairly consistent with things, but he does there's just beautiful little variations on all of the rhythm, or, or many of the riffs that he plays. We've got just very slight variations in the way he plays them as he goes through. Um, Real Stones fans might like to check out that those little variations, but some of you probably it will be a bit overkill, to be honest. Um, the, uh, the, what, what Keith plays in the B section, which is the B chord, he plays the big B chord and lets it ring out. <laughs> a whole bar and then he does a little uh, unison bend uh, so that's first finger in the seventh fret of the second string sorry my brain's not working properly today uh, and the third finger is in the ninth fret of the third string and that's doing a tone bend okay so it's bending up to be the same note it doesn't want to be exactly the same note or it doesn't quite sound so cool you want that little little bit little bit wobbly kind of sound of the two it being slightly out of tune it makes it sound a bit gnarly so it's kind of what you're looking for there um so just literally one two three four one two three four e. about the picking for that riff a little bit for a second because it's not exactly what you would first anticipate because it's you know most guys most of the time will play a down pick on the down beat and, a, and on the and and up strokes on the e and the up so one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a that kind of thing and Mick Taylor generally does that but Keith and Ronnie Wood particularly I've seen them live a few times and they're a lot more kind of haphazard and I think that kind of adds to the feel that they get, that it's not kind of mechanically always how you would think about it. Ron Wood particularly, I've seen up close quite a few times playing kind of rock and roll stuff, and I'm like, how does he make that sound so good? Because it just looks kind of, he'll do all down picks for a bit and then all up picks for a bit and then a mixture and it's like, but it sounds incredible. So I don't, you know, I don't exactly understand how that stuff works, but um, this one I think is fairly consistent. It's just not what you'd think. So. Um, I'm pretty sure this is played down hammer, then a little mute, then down hammer, down, down. So all downs. All down so far. That's up, down, down. Now, either that last one could be a down or an up, they both feel equally as good to me. But what's important there is the downs at the beginning. Down hammer. down still up down 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 definitely if you're going to do that rhythm that's up down up down 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 up down 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 up down let's have a little close up riff at this look
once you've learned the riff again, playing along with the original recording would be a really, really great idea. Just to try and cop that feel and make sure that you're playing exactly along with Keith. Uh, a good tester is to be playing along with the original recording at just the right volume where if you're right in the pocket, your guitar disappears. Okay, I played in a Rolling Stones tribute band for a long time and a lot of the Rolling Stones stuff was about trying to get that pocket and get, get the right feel. It's actually the hardest part, a lot harder than just what the notes are. So, and it's, uh, I I'd found that to be the most valuable way of trying to kind of suck in those, uh, those grooves and the, the, the getting the songs to feel right. So you don't have to maybe take it to that level if you're not a Stones fan, but you know, it's worth it, I think, because it infects everything that you do when you start to absorb good music and, and good feels and good time. I think that's uh, an important part of the deal, I think. Anyways, look, I really, this has probably been quite a long lesson for a, a simple song that's only got four chords or whatever, but I hope that I've given you some insight into playing the tune in a, in a fun way. And uh, I'll see you for plenty more lessons very soon. You take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.